All right. Welcome, everybody, to our very first Film Club bonus episode for the podcast, where we're going to be talking about the film Dune Part One. And I'm joined by a, a great cast of guests today. I'm very, very happy. Some returning. One returning guest. Starting off, we got Matthew Kressel making his second appearance on the show. He's the Nebula World Fantasy and Yuji Award nominated author of the World Mender trilogy and more. His many short stories have been published in Tor.com, io9, Lightspeed, and numerous other magazines and anthologies. How are you? Thanks for having me back. Yeah, glad to have you here. And uh, next up, we have Cody Cisco. He's an author, editor, publisher, and literary community organizer. As an author, he's written two novels in the Resonant Earth series, including Broken Mirror and Tortured Echoes. Thanks for being here, Cody. Hello. Glad to have you here. Thank you. And we also have Patricia A. Jackson. She's a high school language arts teacher and now also an author. Her debut novel, Forging a Nightmare, which you can see in the background on her screen, an urban fantasy is due out in just a couple of weeks. So first of all, congratulations, Patricia, and glad to have you here. Thank you. And thank you for having me in great company. Next up, we have Tiffany Trent. She's author of the Unnaturalist Duology in the Hallowmere series. Her short stories have appeared in Clockwork Cairo, Willful Impropriety, After the Fall, and numerous other publications. She also teaches creative writing in the online MFA program at Southern New Hampshire University. And happy to have you on the panel, Tiffany. Hi, thank you. And finally, we have Liam Quain. He's a British filmmaker and author with experience making short films, writing screenplays, and editing music videos. And now Liam has turned toward alternate storytelling venture, writing novels. Ooh. His debut novel, Road to Juno, was released earlier this year. So congrats on that, Liam, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, happy to have you here too. Happy to have all of you here. And uh, first off, we're going to uh, just go through each of you. If you can give a brief summary of how you were introduced to Dune, whether it's through the original Frank Herbert novels, perhaps even uh, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson's novels, David Lynch's uh, 1980s movie, the 2000 sci-fi miniseries. So we'll start off with Tiffany, if you could give us a quick introduction to your experiences well, with Well, I Dune. think the first time I ever had any interaction with Dune was watching the David Lynch version with my aunt when I was about 12 or 13. And she was, she was babysitting me that night or something. You know, I was hanging out with my aunt. And we both just thought, wow, this is a weird movie. You know, like, this is really weird. And But I was captivated by it. And then um, later on, I read it and got completely sucked into the world, the storytelling. And I ended up doing my master's thesis on Dune and the ecology of Arrakis. Cool. We'll be, we'll be digging into that a little bit yeah. later. But really, really <laughs> cool that you did your yeah, thesis on Dune. Um, Matt, how about you? What was your first introduction to the Dune verse? Yeah, well, um, similar to Tiffany, I think I encountered it in bits and pieces on television and then, um, with the Lynch movie. And then in college, once they, they started playing, uh, the Lynch movie, I don't know, it was like 11 o'clock at night and I'm like, Oh, I'll just watch this. It'll end at one. I'll go to bed. And, and it turns out it was like the extended hmm. cut. And with commercials, so I didn't go to bed till, I don't know, four in the morning and probably missed my class or something. Um, but I was totally enraptured by it. Um, I didn't read the book uh, until about 20 years ago. Um, but again, I was so swept up in the, in the world that um, I think I finished it in about two sittings. It, it's like one, I like read three quarters of it in one day and then the next day immediately woke up and, and read the rest. It was like, it was just kind of this fugue state of I need to finish this. Um, it was since then it's I've reread it uh, maybe half dozen times and uh, it's it's my favorite science fiction book by far. That's pretty intense though because it's it's very dense. Uh, the prose, everything. It's a long book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Patricia, what about you? What's your introduction to Dune? I'm an only child, so when I was in high school, loneliness was a friend that we preferred <laughs> being with people and. Um, I read the book and Paul Atreides' loneliness and his call to the chosen just spoke to my soul. And I ravaged that book. I ravaged uh, Dune Messiah, Children of Dune, and God Emperor of Dune. Things got weird in the fifth book yep. and we just didn't finish. <laughs> and I remember giving the book to my religion teacher, who was a priest, and he read it overnight. And then we discussed it the next day. Um, which was just incredible. And then I saw the film in the theaters and I was just, wow. 
So anything Dune, I was very happy about. But I do have to say, I don't remember the TV show, so it couldn't have been that good. But I was a child, so I'm going to have to be forgiven for that. <laughs> well, the, the TV series came out in 2000, 2001. I was still a child. Yeah, I'm still a child now. <laughs> <laughs> Forever a child, forever a child. Forever. <laughs> oh, man. And Cody, what about you? How did you get introduced to Dune? Yeah, I think um, similar to others, I had seen pieces of it um, on TV, but there were actually copies of Dune and Dune Messiah um, in my family's bookshelves. So after I saw all the crazy stuff with Kyle McLaughlin and Sting, uh, I thought, oh, I have to check this out and um, you know, plowed through those two and then immediately went on to the the rest of the series. And I think at that time, both um, God, uh, Chapter House Dune and Heretics of Dune had been published. So I went all the way through those and didn't understand what was happening. Um, and so much later when um, the Brian Herbert uh, Final Two came out and I understood what was going on, I was like, oh, this is actually masterful. I mean, I enjoyed it all the way along, but um, it was really satisfying to get to the end. Um, so that's kind of my introduction to it. You had some rocky times not understanding what's going on. I think that's pretty par for the course once you get deeper into the books. Yeah. Like, what is going on? <laughs> Just... <laughs> and Liam, what about you? It, I first got introduced to June in 2021 in theaters when I went to see the movie. I did actually say this before, but really quietly. <laughs> um, I Yeah, my first experience was the, the, the Denis Villeneuve film. Uh, and uh, I ended up watching it without obviously knowing anything about the books. And then I've read what the film covered of the book afterwards um, to see if, you know, to for compare and, you know, just to have a nice comparison of, you know, a deeper meaning, trying to find a deeper meaning to, to the film because there's a lot of drawn out space. So I thought there must be stuff that's in that space where no one's talking. And uh, it's it was really like interesting, like being able to actually look at both of them. And I'm very curious what your perspective is going to be. I'll I'll let everyone know my history with Dune in a in a moment, but um, I'm curious to to know what it is like for someone to see the film for the first time without having any prior experience with the series. So yeah, we'll 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 jump into that uh, later on. But my first experience with Dune was the book. Uh, my older brother had it on his, on his bookshelf and I don't know, I just saw like deserts on the cover and I thought, yeah, why not? <laughs> I'm just going to pick this up and see what it's like. That was when I was 16 and it flew over my head for the most part. Um, I really liked Paul as a character, but there was just, uh, a lot of, a lot of names and a lot of, uh, factions to, to keep track of. And I don't think I was capable at that point of fully comprehending everything but um i've since reread dune twice uh one of those times was on a bike trip in sardinia in italy where it was very hot and we were often very low on water and i was reading that book while sleeping on beaches and really felt the intensity of deserts during that during that whole experience uh so it was pretty it was pretty vivid and for that reason i think dune really solidified itself in my mind as like a powerful book with a lot of um meaningful themes and and imagery and every time i look at that book or any time i think of it i just think of sardinian beaches and and feeling dehydrated while riding my bicycle so <laughs> <laughs> um i've also since uh watched the david lynch movie which is just a manic fever dream and i love it for that uh it's kind of like a cool art house film at this point, as opposed to anything that's uh, cinematically um, coherent, I guess. You could say. <laughs> uh, and then I also watched the documentary uh, Jodorowsky's Dune, which also was a fever dream, but in a totally different realm. It's like Jodorowsky levels of hallucinatory uh, ideas, and I love that. Like, I love that documentary just for the the fact that Alejandro Jodorowsky's a maniac a brilliant brilliant maniac but <laughs> they're actually making um the inkle which is his graphic novel god. it's going into production oh my god yes. i have uh i have the inkle before the inkle and the final inkle all upstairs in my comic collection yeah. and love it love it like the mobius the mobius art yeah, style it's... is beautiful 
I think he only did that for the ankle. But once again, it's Yodorowsky, and the story is beautiful nonsense. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, I want to start off getting everybody's uh, reactions to when they first heard about this adaptation being made, and if you've had any experience with uh, Denis Villeneuve's work beforehand to give you any sort of uh, idea of what it could be like, or perhaps comfort that the movie was in good hands. So Matt, let's start with you. Uh, yeah. So, um, I, I was definitely familiar with, uh, Denis Villeneuve's, uh, work from, um, uh, Blade Runner 2049 and, uh, Arrival and Sicario. Um, so I loved all three of those films. I thought that they were all brilliant. Um, um, I think even before I saw Arrival, I, I watched Sicario just to see his style and was just totally enthralled by how he was able to maintain tension for so long. And just he's he's in a, he's an incredible director. He may be um, my favorite director right now of any of, of, of uh, anywhere. But uh, yeah, so so uh, having seen all those three movies and loving them, I mean, um, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. It was similar to what you said about uh, the Lynch's Dune is it's like, I see it as an incredibly expensive art house film. I mean, I, I think it works, but I don't think it has mass appeal. It, it, it's a very cerebral kind of slow moving film, a few action scenes, but not many. So my fear with, with Dune was that he was going to do the same thing, but he, he said very early on that, no, he's going to make an action film. So I was cautiously optimistic that, that, this film was going to uh, be successful. Um, there is an enormous amount in the novel to pack into a film. So they were like, oh, they're only going to do the first half. I'm like, okay, all right, all right. Um, somehow he was able to, like, I, I think the, the elements that he pulled, that he decided not to put in the film were incredibly well chosen to the point that um i know we're going to get into this later but my wife who hasn't read the books and is not really familiar with the story had no problem following it you know she she followed it all the way through so yeah i mean it it, it was um i was i was very excited i mean i i think if anyone um could do this film it was denis villeneuve and and he just he, he knocked it out of the park yeah. and cody what about you what were your initial um thoughts when you heard the movie was being made and then who was directing it uh my first thought was okay i guess we're remaking every classic for every generation and (laughs) if if we take that as a starting point then then why the hell not for dune um i had seen arrival and loved it um it's one of those just grand visual masterpieces um unlike matt i i wish i had liked blade runner 2049 and it just it passed me by and cyberpunk's my genre and it just it left me flat so i was a little bit um anxious about seeing dune because i was like oh well what's going to happen um and i think uh, you know i think there were choices to be made about what goes in and what goes out one of the things i loved about dune the novel was the the factions and how um there are plans within plans and treachery at every step of the way and um in the movie we don't really get to see the emperor or um the spacing guild or chome or all of these other players who have a role on arrakis so um i think that was wise uh, it creates a movie that new uh fans can enjoy um but for me it you know those parts felt um missed mm-hmm. and patricia what about you i was cost- cautiously optimistic about the film coming out, uh, I never look at directors. I see a film that looks interesting and I'm going for it. I just want to go for it. I don't care who's in it. Not always. Jason Momoa. Yeah. Anyway, um, I did not like Arrival. I do own the new Blade Runner. I was very disappointed, though it's a movie that I will watch um, over and over again. Sicario is a comfort film. When I write sometimes, I'll just put a movie on that makes me feel good, and that's Sicario. So I can't even tell you how many times I've seen that. But when I heard they were doing a new film, 
my feeling is the same feeling I had if I heard someone was redoing Star Wars, I will get arrested if it is not done correctly. Um, so I was afraid because I was in love with Kyle McLaughlin. I thought the film was great. It's a big art kind of thing. It was cerebral. It's kind of like The Hobbit. If you just weren't in the club, if you didn't read it, you didn't understand the membership perks. Um, but so I, so I was worried. And the Spacing Guild, I missed that. In some cases, it just wasn't alien enough. I want to see the weirdness because um, there's a lot of weirdness going on. But it was covered in other places, the Bene Gesserit and some other things, the Sardaukar and that sort of thing. We had to let some people in the club that had not read the book. So, <laughs> yeah, so it, so it was good. It was good. And um, I was happy. But if I had to pick my favorite, I would go back to the Lynch film. All right. And Tiffany, what was your um, initial reaction to the film being announced? Uh, all the news that was coming out, the director. All everything? I could see in my head when I heard that it was uh, being made w again was uh, that scene with Paul and the Reverend Mother um, where he says, you know, they tried and failed. And she says they tried and died. And that was what I was worried about with the film was like, <laughs> we're, you know, here you know, is this going to be the Kwisatz Haderach of Dune films? Finally, you know, like um, I, I was, um, I was worried, and I, it, it really had nothing to do with the director. I'm, I, I actually haven't seen any of the other things, um, of his. It was more just everybody keeps trying to do this, and it's really hard, and it's really easy to miss it, and I, I still feel like Lynch captured some of the atmosphere, even if he got the story completely wrong at the end. You know what I mean? I, I still feel like that atmosphere, that weirdness, like Patricia's talking about, I missed, I really did miss the spacing guild, you know, in um, this new version, but um, I'm not going to completely pan the new version. There were, I think it was definitely good at making the film and the story accessible. And, and if, if it garners more fans, that's great, you know? Um, but, yeah. uh, I was worried, but, but ultimately, um, after my first viewing of the new version, I was pleased. So. Cool. Well, we'll, we'll get in, we'll get a little deeper into first reactions, but Liam as the only one who hasn't, uh, read the book or hadn't read the books, uh, since you've read the first half now, um, what compelled you to go to the theater or to go on HBO max and, and, and watch the movie. What did you heard before that made you think like, Oh, this is something worth putting some time into. Um, I, 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 I actually went for the director more than the, the, the property I'd heard of the property. And I've seen, I've, I saw it being parodied in SpongeBob SquarePants. That was amazing. So uh, I was a big fan. And, uh, I decided I have to watch it in theaters because I don't have a choice because HBO Max isn't available in my country. So um, I had no choice. And I think I was, I'm more thankful for that because it was genuinely one of the biggest things I'd ever seen in the cinema. I've been going for it like over, you know, years and it actually like made me jaw drop, which is a bit, tricky nowadays because you've seen so much and so much cgi so much so many explosions but for some reason there was something special about this film and i think it was because it was so slow it took its time and that's what really appealed to me that and like the the influences the stories had are like obviously numerous and it I'm trying to, th it might have been a more pure experience if not in a kind of been inspired by it, if that makes any sense. Um, like, would you be able to enjoy The Godfather more if you never watched, like, The Simpsons before it? And if you know what I mean? Because, <laughs> like, they lampoon so much that it, it kind of, you don't know whether or not it dilutes the effect. But I, I absolutely adored Dune without having read the book at all. Because, uh, 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 sorry, go on. No, no, I was just going to ask if you wanted to dig a little bit deeper since you're trailing nicely into your initial impressions. If you want to sort of 
give an idea of what really worked for you and if there are any aspects that didn't work for you. Um, spoilers or no spoilers? Spoilers, man. This is a this is a review podcast. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, well, the film. Uh, the first thing I thought of after after you know when the credits were rolling was the film seemed to be very triangular in in structure. It was gigantic at the beginning, and then slowly as we we started getting closer, you know, more in depth with Arrakis and the world of the Fremen. It started to like this focus started to shift inwards, and by the end, it was like a solid point, like, like looking down a line of people walking out, uh, which I really liked because the it's all about nepotism and uh, privilege and prestige, and that's measured on screen at the beginning by how big it is because that's the world they live in. So there's these great acres that Paul has to cross just to speak to his father and he takes a really long time to walk there and that shows you how much land they own literally just literally just shows you how much space they occupy uh, in the world and then as you know the attack happens uh, and the you know the Harkonnens move in uh, they lose that wealth and so they literally lose the space they're in and, and end up in caves which is Again, doesn't tell you any of this. It's just it's all visual, and also the 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 land that they're walking across in order for Paul to talk to his father, Duke Leto. It's a graveyard. It's a it's a <laughs> massive cemetery filled with ancestors, and so it's telling you like this as you're walking across this land. This is your legacy, and all of that just to talk to your father. And it's, I think I think you touched on a really nice point there in terms of the 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 privilege that that is presented at the beginning of the film and then and then broken down um as as the movie progresses is there anything for you that didn't really particularly land um yeah uh, but it's it was more to do with it was it's more meditative than i'm um i enjoy like i do i i watch all range of films i watch all different genres from, you know, like um, the slow black and white older films to, you know, anime. I, like, I, I try and, like, watch as many different varieties. And it it felt a bit like Blade Runner 2049, but with a, a sandy skin over the top. I know it sounds a bit strange because they're completely different stories, but it's just, it's, it did seem like it made 2049 a pitch piece so he could direct Dune. Um, but I was, I'm not, I'm not really that much of a critic, honestly. I don't, I'm not really a disliker. I, 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 I kind of respected. Uh, I was in too much awe to kind of dislike what I was seeing. Plus, I, I didn't have any attachment to the to the novel. Uh, I, I will, I will say, like the fact I was expecting a specific shot all the way through, based on a trailer view, and that never came. And because that shot wasn't in the movie i i legitimately felt like i'd only seen half half the movie but then (laughs) that was the point so it's it's just a bit tricky yeah it's a strange disclaimer it's like this is not dune full stop this is dune part one (laughs) of two parts (laughs) um (laughs) tiffany as someone who's a little bit um I i would say more invested in in your personal experience with dune and you know having read more of the books what was it like for you seeing this this film for the first time? This version, the latest version, was that um yeah yep. uh I was I was struck by the sweeping grandeur. I felt like he really captured that with everything was vast, sort of like what Liam was saying about this vast land they had to walk across, and I found it interesting. Um, what scenes were inserted, you know, in order to help make the story more accessible and to make the inner emotional monologues that are in the book maybe more external as action. I felt like a lot of that was, I felt like there was an attempt to externalize a lot of those interior monologues. I was, I was really worried, in fact, like this is such an interior book. How, you know, I knew how Lynch had gotten that interiority is because know you would hear everyone's thoughts but like (laughs) which was kind of weird but fun 
but how are we going to do this in another version? And so I felt like there were scenes inserted, like that scene in the graveyard that never happens in the book. You know, there's never that conversation and there's never that there's never that sort of give and take between father and son. Like, hey, I feel just like you felt, you know, I felt just like you feel right now. And, and you know, that's okay. There, that was not there, you know, in, in the book. So there were some things I was, I was interested in the shifts. And I tried to understand that one made sense to me with the Duke and with Paul. But then there was also a shift with Jessica that I had a lot of problems with, actually. Um, I love the way she was portrayed in the Lynch film. She was very um, composed, uh, self-contained, um, very aware of what she had done and why what she had done was not going to be looked upon favorably and almost a bit defiant about it, you know, because. She had born a son when she was supposed to bear a daughter. But in the most recent version, she's very weepy and, and nervous. She's constantly like freaking out, you know, behind a closed door or whatever. And I'm just like, that doesn't feel like her to me, you know? So, so some of the characterizations were, were interesting to me, but um, like the choices were interesting. Like, why do that when? You know, we've already seen it a different way and it works. Um, so, but overall, just my impression when it stopped and they were walking across the dune was like, I would have sat here for two more hours so that I could yeah, finish it because I want to get to that part because that's my favorite part, you know, like, so I would, I am definitely on board for, for part two, but yeah. That was that was the biggest thing. Yeah, and we'll get into characterization a little bit later. I'm completely on the same page as you about uh, Lady Jessica. Way too weepy, way too conflicted. Mm -hmm. You know, own own your shit. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but um, Cody, what was uh, what was your initial impression of the movie once credits started rolling? Hmm. I mean, I agree that the the grandeur was captured. Like as Tiffany said, um, we get a sense of this of the scale of the universe and what's happening. I do think some of that intimacy was lost. It felt a little bit emotionally flat for me in a way that surprised me. Um, because, you know, Paul's journey is one of loss. He loses his father, he loses his role, um, his kingdom. And I, I didn't quite feel that in a way that um, I had in the book, certainly, and also in, in the previous adaptations. And similarly with Jessica, I mean, she's one of the most interesting characters because she is someone who defies all the expectations that are placed on her um, for love, you know, for love of her, um, not husband, because they're not married, but <laughs> um, for her Duke. And um, I don't know, I think some of that, some of that um, personal, intimate struggle was lost in the vastness of the story for me. Um, maybe we'll see more of that in the second half where, you know, like Liam says, it narrows into a smaller story. Um, that's my hope anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like the the scale, there's a lot of world building that takes place in the beginning. And some of the characterization gets muddled up in all of that as things start to focus more and more as the movie goes on. Uh, Patricia, what was your initial impression of the film? Grace. I just thought it had such class as far as the film. Uh, as a writer, you're always looking for the stakes. What are the stakes? And they couldn't have been higher. And for some people, that was just too much high blood pressure. But that was wonderful. And I love when we talk about the land and the acres that Paul had to walk across to get to his father, because that was the footprint of their aristocracy. Um, but it was not binding it broke. And I know he's going to go to a people whose aristocracy is not one they rule over. It is the Fremen and it is the entire desert planet of Arrakis. And while people are trying to own this planet, the Fremen are coexisting with it. 
And while you have um, the Harkonnens and the Emperor and they're trying to bring things under control, those things that are bigger than the Fremen, they worship. And that was just a whole different set of values that were going to last. And these other folks were going to just absolutely been be brought down. Um, I guess I was okay with Jessica because as a teacher, I work with a lot of moms that should be rational, but when it comes to their children, forget it. And I will say this, the only good Jedi is a dead Jedi. I like the Sith. <laughs> I like broken. Um, the Bene Gesserit are almost too composed. She's no longer under their thumb, under their rule. She's with this man. She's broken. She loves him. She broke the rules for him. So for her, well, she a little weepy potentially, but again, I know a lot of moms when it comes to their kids, they get a little crazy. I felt she pulled it together when she needed to and helped him pull his shit together when he needed to, like a good mother would. And I agree with Tiffany. I didn't realize this film was a two-parter. So when they ended, as he had the fight with the one Fremen, I was like, wait, mm-hmm. credits? What is, what is that? I'm ready. Let me get some popcorn. I'm ready for the next two hours because that is the best part. But, um, Grace, just quiet Grace. Though I felt the Harkonnens, while scary, not nearly as menacing as the Lynch film. Not nearly as menacing. And well, yeah, I I agree with you on the Harkonnen aspect. We'll we'll get into that afterwards. But Matt, we'll get into your first impressions too. Um, so when I saw it in the theater, the whole I saw it in an IMAX theater. I don't know how many people were there, a couple hundred, and everybody clapped. And I was, I got the chills. Like I, I just. I, I was just in awe. And, and um, I think the, for the first 10 or 15 minutes, at, you know, knowing the book really well, I was going in kind of uh, looking at the cinematography and, and the acting. And, and, um, and, and I think it was probably around the time where Paul walks across the, um, the grass and the tombstones to go speak to his father. I just, I completely got immersed in the film and forgot that I was watching a movie. And I think that's the sign of a, of a, of a good film is that you just get so engrossed in it. And I think I, I, my attention was held so thoroughly probably until the, the point where, um, Paul and Jessica, um, hide out, um, in the old ecological research station. And I think the reason why at that point I was sort of knocked out of it a little bit was that it was just like, it was, it seemed to be like one chase scene after another at that point. And it was just like, okay, okay, let's, let's, let's build the story because the the Dune story, as we all know, is just so huge, so big. There's so much going on. Um, And, and I know some of you said that, you know, Lynch's film was weirder. And, and I think that there's, Definitely, we, I mean, Lynch is like the king of weird, and and Lynch definitely like aced the weirdness of his film. But I, I said this film is weird. Like, let, let let's talk about like when uh, the Sardar car are getting their sacrament, and the guys are just going, and you hear like that creepy voice, and then they're like they have people crucified upside down. They're using their blood for the sacrament, and then you know Baron Harkonnen is is in the 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 oil and vinegar <laughs> bath healing, <laughs> and um, you know, just, just creepy shit and, and weird shit. And they, the, um, you know, they don't even explain the mentats. I mean, they yeah. sort of do. They're like, they're like, who fear? What, what's the number? And he's like, you know, this many millions, his eyes roll into his head, not explained at all. Um, you know, we all know what that, I mean, I, I guess everyone who's read the book, Liam, maybe you don't know, but like the, you know, we all know why this is. Um, but if you don't know, that's super weird. And then, you know, also like, Yes, I, I would have liked to have seen more space travel. Like, I love science fiction. Like, whatever they did, it was like a wormhole. I couldn't quite figure out how space travel was depicted in this. Um, but you do see the Spacing Guild. You know, they show up with their, um, when they do the change of the watch, when they come to, to Caladan, um, you see the Spacing Guild in the background. They have these, like, helmets, which I presume were filled with spice gas. So, so they are there. They are depicted. and. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing for me when, I, when the film ended was I stopped and I said, wait, the emperor didn't even show up. Like we went through this whole film, two and a half hours. The emperor wasn't even there. 
um, you know, I asked my wife, I said, oh, you, did you notice that? And she's like, oh, I thought the, the Baron was the emperor. I said, no, no, he's just one of the houses. Um, and I think that was a really interesting directorial choice on the part of uh, Denis Villeneuve because it it just sets up for the second film, like there's going to be something amazing that we haven't seen. And I, I think they're going to do, to show some of those things that they couldn't show, like what exactly the Mentats are and how, you know, more of the Spacing Guild and some of the Emperor stuff. and. Um, you know, the, the, the water of life. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the scene where they, they drink the, the, uh, the, the wor- the liquid from the baby worm and hallucinate and have like group orgies. Like, <laughs> you imagine what this, <laughs> this director is going to do with that? I mean, you know, it's gotta be PG 13. So maybe they'll leave out the orgy part. But, uh, um, I, I just, I just was, was blown away by this. And, and I, and I do feel like, like, Yes, there were parts of it where I was I was left like, okay, they 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 cut this out. They could have done more with this and more with that. But I, I was I'm satisfied that this was a complete film because I I think that if they tried to put all of that stuff in, it would just be weighed down. It was like it would be like you know uh, you know you take a nice smooth piece of paper, you pour water on it, it gets weak, it falls apart. Like I I feel like this is a nice taut, perfectly paced film, and I wouldn't really add anything to it. Although I do want to see, um, I heard there is a, a scene with, uh, Gurney playing the Balasset, which they cut out, which I would like to see. And there's a, there's the dinner scene, which they shot and filmed. So the famous dinner scene where everyone's has plans within plans within plans all going on at the same time, they shot that, but they cut it because it's for pacing. Well, actually on that note, the dinner scene is one thing that, that was really a glaring omission for me because it felt like um it felt like one of the first points where paul came together as a character for me in the book where i felt like he's starting to understand how big of a role he has in this whole picture and how all of these other factions and characters have their own motivations and it created a really nice uh complexity in the book and i felt that that was missing from from paul um in the film but i want to you know tiffany's touched on it matt you touched on it just now if anyone else has any um omissions that they felt were justifiable or bothered them if anyone wants to jump in on that i just want to celebrate the diversity um leah kinds being a black woman shock that was so wonderful and just such a cool character and brought a cultural richness to the Fremen and the sandworms were phenomenal. I just <laughs> un- unbelievable. I'll I'll pass the I'll pass the rod to someone else. <laughs> Anyone else want to jump in? Any omissions that you that you liked or thought were um taken out for uh detriment of the film? I I mean I think they intentionally th- there's a part where I think through fear in the book suspects that there's a traitor in, mm. in the house. And I think they suspect Jessica. And I almost feel like it would have added more intrigue that, you know, the Duke is suspecting his concubine. And, but I, I understand why they cut it. Cause I think that they didn't have enough time to develop that enough. Um, but I, I, so, so it's like this, when Dr. UA comes in and, you know, betrays the Duke it sort of comes out of nowhere, but at the same time, it's like, oh yeah, okay. Um, like, I mean, we all know it was coming, but I, I, I almost wish that they they did this in like, you know, a mini series over seven episodes or something, so that that we could see all these things play out in time and develop these characters and develop where you know their abilities and, and their, you know, complexities. Um, so, you know, I, I didn't necessarily miss that, but I think that it was a nuance that, you know, probably was rightfully cut from the film, but that yeah. would have been cool. Yeah, to and see. I think a lot of the things that were cut, um, were cut for the sake of time. And like you say, Matt, what suffered wasn't necessarily the film as a whole, but the nuance that underpins yeah. it. 
I, um, sort of the, the relationships between I was characters. Gonna Tiffany, add go ahead. with Dr. Yue, I felt like um, the seriousness of what he had done was lost because the nuance of the fact that he broke his imperial conditioning. I mean, the entire reason those doctors are able to function within any imperial, you know, with any household in the Landsrat is because they are conditioned to be loyal and to care for the health of the family that they're with. And so for him to betray, to, to have his conditioning broken was a huge deal. And, you know, they kept, I know they kept trying to show the diamond, you know, like just to yeah. show. And if you know, you know, if you're like, kind of like what Matt's saying, if you know about that, then you know. But if, if you've never read the books or haven't seen any other version, you don't realize what a big deal that was. Um, and just how yeah. messed up this guy was to think that the Baron was really going to keep his wife alive for him you know just well i've heard an interesting theory on that is that that ua knew that his wife was dead but okay. this was his chance to revenge to well obviously revenge. there was that turnabout with the yeah. tooth yeah where that was the only way he could get close mm -hmm. to him um plans within plans but yeah the the imperial conditioning part i missed yeah, and once again, that's just comes down to nuance. And I mean, I imagine uh, Liam, you're listening to all this. I don't know how much of this you really picked up on, or from like a storytelling perspective, if if a lot of it, it worked for you. Uh, it, uh, believe it or not, like uh, it it actually did. I I did get a lot from the characters while I was watching it. I I, I the there was a frustration with the doctor's performance that I was sitting there going like. You're keeping secrets, aren't you? And <laughs> yeah, he was uh, a lot. Um, and th there was one thing I noticed in the book that I actually, after uh, I know this is going to be sacrilege, but after watching the film, I read the part in the book and I actually preferred the film's version of it, which was Rabba, his overall image uh, uh, compared to that. Because in the book, he's basically another another baron isn't he uh, which might be the point he might be like trying to emulate his father that type of thing but Caston Batista Dave Batista who to me is the best wrestling actor out there not just in terms of performance but in terms of like work ethic and behavior too he, he's just he's just like incredibly loyal and a really good person to have on a set you can tell and with him being in it like he was it felt like it. There was kind of. It felt like there was a missing piece of the puzzle there with him, because he was. He's kind of hulking, and the it's like kind of the one component the Harkonnens are missing, or is someone like that who is a basically a powerhouse. Um, and compared to what's a uh, what I can't remember his name. The character who Sting played. Played rather. Fayed, Right, yeah, though. yeah. Um, I I did uh, after watching the film. I did hear like rumors about his casting, and uh, they made me really excited. But there's, I've heard two rumors now. Both of them conflict with each other in terms of theme, and he compliments. If it's the casting number one or two, like they complement the family dynamic because of how different they are from the Baron and from Batista. Which I think is nice because it has that strange middle middle child type syndrome, like the like, just how he is. He's like a a mix of Baron and the Sting character whose name keeps escaping me, <laughs> even though you've just said it. <laughs> I agree. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, Cody, uh, jump into it, but then um, afterwards, if you want to continue, um, since Liam just brought up uh, the Harkonnens, we'll get into some characters. If you want to. Uh, talk about some omissions, but then also we'll start with representation of the Harkonnens and yes. if you have any criticisms or anything like that. Yes, that's the missing piece. I felt like we got two um, two legs of the three, the tripod of the Harkonnen family. You know, we get the Baron and we understand that he's a monster <laughs> because of his 
very dark bath that he takes, which I, I assume is the Benny Tlilax like healing gel that we don't know anything about until like maybe book three or four. <laughs> um, but you know, we get we get the Baron and we get um, Raban, and then there's this missing piece. And I, I think what's missing there is their rivalry. You know, Fade Ralta and, and Raban are fighting to be the heir to the Harkonnen throne, and that becomes important um, later on. And so that was, you know, I'm sure we'll get to see more of that. Um, but uh, I, I, think, I think more time with the Harkonnens would have been a good thing. Um, the, the Lynchian film set up so much uh, weird and gross body horror stuff that I, I love <laughs> from a genre perspective, so I don't mind seeing that. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, in this movie, it, it makes them a good fit with the Sadakar um, in that they're both kind of the worst that humanity has to offer in terms of what they do to people. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll see more of them in the next movie. Yeah, but I, I think you, you, you brought up a good point there because the rivalry between them, it resulted, I mean, the absence um, of his brother resulted in this... Um, there's like a lack of conflict within the Harkonnens themselves. Yes. Yeah. And I think yes. that internal struggle really elevated them in the books mm -hmm. and made them, uh, made them more believable as people made them more relatable, even though they're, they're vile and disgusting. Um, yeah. One of the things I love about the books is that there's no uncomplicated development. There is always a turn in action or a complication within the characters or a new conflict between um, the houses, for example. And so to, to, for anything to be one dimensional is just not Herbert. <laughs> yeah. In my view. Yeah. And Patricia, you brought up earlier your issues with the, with the Harkonnens. You said they weren't menacing enough. Um, do you want to build on Def that? Definitely scary. Definitely gross, which was interesting. But what was interesting between Fayette and Raban is there was this sadistic beauty and the beast thing in the Lynch film. And that was definitely missing. Raban was, a, he was the closest to the Baron and he was just this hulking monster, just walking ugly. And then there's Fade, he was beautiful. And, but as he was beautiful, he was so ugly on the inside and sadistic. And then the other weird element is it was sort of like the family that plays together stays together. It was like the Baron was in love with them or had a thing with them. It was just this weird... Because he was so ugly too, but Fayed was so beautiful and it almost like he was attracted to them or attracted to him in some way. And that dynamic was just lost. It just wasn't there. And maybe that was the intention, but it definitely took away from that character development. Scary, yes. Menacing, no. They just had a big hammer and they were going to hit and smash things with it. That's all it was. Yeah. Anyone else have some uh, final thoughts on the hard well, comments? I, there was... There's one thing from the book um, that I actually was grateful was not in the movie. And that was um, the very clear homophobia of the book, um, casting the Baron as this, um, you know, a gay menace. You know, he, he lusts after all these young boys in the novel. And he's lusting after his own nephew, Fade. Um, I didn't really miss that. So I was sort of, I was glad to see that that was not part of the menacing gross package. Do you know what I mean? Um, Cause I think there were some, there were some issues there um, back in the sixties about that, writing that. And so I'm glad that wasn't there, but at the same time, I do feel like not having Fade there uh, really, really sort of unbalances things because um, Fade is also a possibility, another genetic possibility, you know, for the Kwisatz Haderach. And if, if Jessica had done what she was supposed to, he would have probably produced that or been close to that. So, um, you know, that's one thing that's cool in the Lynch film when they're fighting because it's really um, sort of parallel copies of one another, you know, um, fighting each other for supremacy. Um, but uh, I think that 
I think that there are there are good things about not making the Baron. Um, I don't know. I think our social mores have changed a lot, thankfully, and so I was really glad that 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 card wasn't played as much um, in this version um, as it was in the book for yeah. sure. Because I think yeah. I think it's extra pl- problematic because of the fact that he's portrayed as grotesque and and morbidly exactly. obese and yeah. almost slug like, and it's kind of like bringing this bad representation to to homosexuality by pairing it with this this pretty outwardly disgusting uh, physique of the Baron, and also his personality right. is just grotesque as well. Right. So Liam, you're going to say something. Um, I I uh, have a a strange take on this because um. I'm LGBT and I it's a bit strange I, I one of the books I'm planning has a villain in it and he has it the two main central characters of this book is a gay couple and it's the father of one of the characters and he's the overarching villain of the whole story but I want to do something different so he's dead throughout the entire thing he doesn't come back to life he is dead but he's still the villain He's not a ghost. His messages and teachings are kind of his weapons that exist beyond his life. It's not sci-fi. He's literally just tra- he's, he's produced so much trauma. And funny thing was, while doing a bit of research for this podcast, I found out that I re- accidentally wrote Frank Herbert, which was strange because obviously it, he, he did the good book and wrote the story that inspired all our favorite stories that type of thing but he had a he had a, a like a weird he was almost kind of married to logic and whenever i like look at media whenever i try and consume media or whatever the phrase is i'm always on the look for like a hundred percent genius and he he was clever but he kind of really badly stumbled when it comes to that type of area like that the type of people because he saw them as anti-human he didn't he didn't see them as like you know he saw it as something that can be grown out of which he says a lot and it made me wonder like did he think he grew out of it because he did he said it a lot it, it even says it in the book doesn't it like um doesn't a character say like it's something for boys to grow out of, uh, which is directly linked to a quote of his, of his, and I I didn't find it offensive because I it all that all that happens is you lose my respect. That's kind of it, but it's it was kind of like Joe the writer, the stranger in a strange land, like. Yeah, so it's like him. This they're like so close, but the or they just slip up, and it's it's just kind of it's a shame more than an offense to me because he could have done a lot more good with what he had upstairs than to lean into like almost a religious fascination with human human reproduction. He he, he saw gay people as like the the thing to stop the human race from breeding. And that's what my villain saw, and like the I wrote that villain seeing that, and I gave him a really big gap in his knowledge in order to do that, because mm. he's an old school intellectual who, uh, you know, he would have voted Republican because he liked fiscal, fiscal control that type of thing, which is uh, noble in its sentiments, but it doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it exists. It doesn't mean it actually is what people do. So with when the I knew it was not going to... I'd heard stories anyway, so I knew it was never going to be see the light of day in the film whatsoever. Um, But I kind of would have... I kind of would have... I wouldn't have really fully admitted it just because um, I'd, I'd rather the Sully hand left, be left on the, on the, the art, basically. I'd, I'd rather leave his mistake in there because i don't think he would be homophobic now with climate the climate crisis and overpopulation i do think he would have shifted a little bit doesn't mean he wouldn't be a tiff but he he, you know what i mean because that's kind of the new version of his tiffness is is the new version of his doctrine really isn't it like 
like the 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 put in science before humanity and it's it's just a, a mess um so i was i was a bit disheartened to see it kind of getting whitewashed out when he kind of doesn't deserve it mm. so, you're, say, so right. you're saying frank herbert could have grown out of it right? <laughs> I, I i think i think he could have grown out of it yeah if he was a mortal but um <laughs> but yeah um I I'm, I might be speaking. Uh, obviously, I never met the man. I was dead when when he was prominent. Um, so you know, um, maybe he wouldn't have. Maybe he just would have got worse. Uh, Do, I'm not sure. Does anyone else have any any thoughts on that? Do you think it was a uh, a product of the time, or do you think because this what this book was written in '62, I believe? But but then again, you know, we we never know. We we don't know Frank Herbert like you say, Liam. But oh, well, you, I can you I can to speak to that directly because. As part of my research on him, I read a lot of biography and I, I read a lot of stuff. And he had um, his eldest son, Bruce, was gay. And it, he took that as a great betrayal of him. Um, and and uh, they never saw eye to eye, I don't think, um, throughout their relationship. So I don't know that he would grow out of it. Um, I think he felt very betrayed by it. Um, and I think that's part of maybe, you know, I, I hate to, I hate to like mix author life and author intent because, and I also do want to say that I think, I think it would be disingenuous of us socially to say that we can't have gay villains because of course we can, we need gay villains. Mm -hmm. But um, their villainy shouldn't be that they are gay, you know, that that's mm. that's, I guess, the difference I'm trying to make. Um, and so I don't know. I mean, from what I read in his biography and the things that went on between him and his son, I don't. I don't really think he would have grown out of that, but he was very he was very ecologically aware, definitely, you know. Well, since you since you wrote your thesis on that, um, do you want to dig into what your thesis was about, and then I guess we could get into the ecological, um, environmentalist uh, notions of the novel, and then how that's represented in the movie as well. Sure. So, um, in in when I was working on my master's degree in literature, um, and I have, I'm I, I'm a glutton for punishment because I have three master's degrees. I have an MA in lit. I have an MFA in creative writing and an MS in environmental studies. So I'll put that out there. Um, why? Don't ask me why. Um, <laughs> because I just can't stop learning, I guess. Um, in this thesis, what I was working with, um, I was thinking about the ecology of Arrakis in terms of Darwinian metaphor. Um, and because I had a professor who was a Darwinian scholar, and then I had a really cool professor who did lit in ecology and science fiction. Um, so what I looked at what, were what kind of Darwinian metaphors are obvious in Dune and um, sort of what happens when, you know, there are two sort of main lines of metaphor. There's competition and there's cooperation. And you need both competition and cooperation to evolve. But what sort of happens in the Dune novels, if you sort of watch over time, is every time there's um, a cooperation, then suddenly there's a giant leap in the evolution of the plot, the characters, et cetera, et cetera. Every time there's competition, um, something breaks apart. Um, The competition doesn't necessarily yield... um, the same rich evolutionary reward that collaboration does. So I was looking at that over time and then noticing too, um, as we, as sort of Paul actually ends up not taking the path that he was supposed to, you know, he talks constantly about his terrible purpose and he sees that his terrible purpose is that he's going to bring jihad to the entire universe which he does but that's not really what he was meant to do it's only his son who actually learns to become one with the sandworms and 
and starts um, becoming one with the planet, um, essentially. So ultimately, I felt like what I was seeing was that, you know, a lot of people try to use Darwinism and all that kind of stuff, like um, social Darwinism to sort of exclude others. But what I really found was that the more um, collaboration that we saw in the novels, the, the more things blossomed, the more um, things became richer and more unique and more special. Um, and a total side note, one of the papers that I read um, talked about the use of color in Dune. And go back and read the book because every time something bad happens, the color yellow appears before it. That has nothing to do with my paper, but it was one of the papers <laughs> that I read. And I was just like, I went back and literally wow. highlighted all the places where there was yellow because it's true. It's really true. So he, cool. He uses color in interesting ways too. But that was basically the idea that I had about how um, there are way, different ways to evolve. And the novel really focuses in on people and beings collaborating um, in order to make things change. Um, so that was a really, that was a really fun thing to, to research and to, I actually went to the, um, the dunes in Florence, Oregon, where Dune was born as part of that and got to sit there and just see one of the big things that inspired him was the way in which they anchored the dunes using seagrass and then using native pines to keep the dunes from shifting or um, going away. So that's fascinating. Well, Tiffany, um, please send me that that your thesis. Yeah, you, I need. I'll need it. to dig to it up. It. It's probably several. <laughs> it's several hard drives back. <laughs> like I don't even. Yeah, it's you know. Yeah. That's, Whenever you find yeah, it, twenty years yeah, ago. Yeah, because that sounds that sounds really interesting. Um, Cody, do you want to do you want to jump in here on this notion of uh, um, cooperation versus? Uh, yeah, that's it's a fascinating way of conflict. looking at it, and I I hadn't um, read that into the series before, so I think next time I go through it, I'll be looking for that specifically. I I think when I um, had had pictured the big changes that occur over the course of the novels, it's really a matter of revolution. Um, and what we have at the start of, you know, Dune part one is a fractured society that is, is very, very rigid and structured. Um, you have the Mentats, you have the Bene Gesserit, you have all these factions we've talked about who are staying within their lanes and doing one specific thing. The Spacing Guild is only doing transportation. And for that, they extract the high price of uh, being the biggest spice users in the universe. Um, but what happens with Paul and with um, his alliance with the Fremen is a revolution. Um, the Empire does not stand because it, it, it falls under um, a new regime, really, that is born of the desert, of you know, a kind of weird version of uh, Wahhabism that uh, Herbert borrowed from. And, it, and for me, I think it's fascinating to see that happen again and again over the course of the books where you have a very um, detailed picture of society emerge. I think he was a, um, a very skilled social observer. Um, and then he finds a way in each book to subvert that and to have a, a new force or a new paradigm come forward and be the, the kind of governing philosophy. Um, but now that I know about the cooperation and competition, um, dynamism there i think that's i think that's a really interesting um drive um throughout the course of the books that i hadn't recognized yeah and and matt do you want to jump in on the um, you know building on top of what tiffany and cody have just said about competition and and cooperation but from an environmental perspective you know we have the fremen the sandworms the actual planet of arrakis and how do you think that was represented in the film um yeah, so so I, I think that um, you know, for me, Dune the the book and the film, it's it's very much about how 
it's a very much about human hubris and and how like the forces of nature are always so much bigger than us that even at the moment when we feel we have the most control is actually when we're the weakest. So you, you know you see that with you know House Atreides, this powerful house taking over this powerful planet. You know the the source of of basically space travel for the whole galaxy, and they're just obliterated. And then you know the Bene Gesserit for generations they've been trying to breed. Uh, the Kwisatz Haderach, and have control over over someone who can predict the future, and they lose control of him. Paul himself loses control. Um, over and over again, we see this um, in, in Dune. We, we see this with, like, you know, uh, Liet Kynes, the, the planetary ecologist. Uh, they came there basically to terraform the planet. And what they 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 discovered that the, the like they, this would kill the worms, and they realized that the worms were super necessary, uh, not just to stay young, but for space travel. So that they they stopped this, they stopped this project. So in in the film, when when they go to the the old research station, you see like the plants look like they've been left left to die for. I mean, maybe someone's tending them, but they're barely staying alive. So it 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 seems to me like. That the, there's a message over and over again that you know the forces of nature are bigger than us. That human hubris. We like to think that we have all this power over things, but there are forces uh, that are much greater than us. And and I think that's exactly what the worm mm. represents. Shai Halud is just this giant force that um, you know um, that clearly um, you know is is a metaphor for our our you know, Herbert's version of God, whether, you know, um, it, it's like this force that comes and it destroys things and we fear it and it, it could totally obliterate us. But at the same time, um, you know, we respect it and we revere it and we, we treat it as something um, awe invoking. Right. Um, and literally awesome, and and I, so I, I just like from from that point of view, I, I think that uh, you know what, one of the things that um, hard SF sometimes can fail badly at is when they go into religion, and but I, I feel as if like Dune goes into that religious aspect with this kind of. Um, like approaching it as the mystery that it is. Like we don't know why the 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 worms produce this spice that has such a psychotropic effect on human consciousness. We don't know um what all this means, um, but we respect it and 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 we're in awe of it. And and anyone who's not in awe of it, anyone who doesn't respect it is obliterated, destroyed. And and that to me is is a is a very religious point of view. Um, and I, I think that's why the, the, the book in general works so well. And, and the other, the other thing too, even in the film is like, yes, there's technology, but it's not like robots and, and, you know, gadgets. It's, it's very much a human story. I think, I mean, there's obviously technology around them, but it's not central to the, to the story. And it's just it's just about people. And so on this on this note that you were talking about of of you know we have um, people, but then we also have this awesome nature, the sandworms, all this. How about the fremen? How you know, Patricia? I'll I'll, I'll toss this to you. How do you think they um, the film potentially succeeds in in representing what what Matt was describing in terms of like the fremen point of view, which is that. Um, nature is inexplicable sometimes, uh, and there is this awe factor to it. And, um, you know, but then we also have the Fremen who ride the sandworms in this ultimate form of cooperation. You know, this test of cooperation is being able to successfully mount and then ride a sandworm through the desert. So what do you think, Patricia, about the, um, the Fremen uh, from your experiences with the books and then how that was portrayed? When Matt was talking, I was really thinking about those palm trees in this new film and how the gardener says they would die without him. And that was a very spiritual moment because then you see them on fire, yeah. you know, when the Harkonnens come back in. And um, I think the outsiders that come to this world, 
are bringing in religion. I am not a religious person, but I am a spiritual person. And I wrote my book to break religion. When someone said to my mother, you weren't baptized correctly, that put me on a mission of destruction. In any case, back to the film. The Fremen, however, are spiritual people. And they're not trying to control anything. They're not trying to take anything. They're trying to live in cooperation with everything. And I like what Tiffany said about the cooperation because there's still competition among the Fremen. You have the fight, you know, with Paul at the end um, that results in a death. But that was survival. This was not about greed. It was not about profits. Okay. So as far as the sandworms, Shahalud, being God elevated, that when you have a respect for nature and you learn how to live with nature and to live with those things bigger than yourself, that when you have a need, those things will allow you to lift you up, to get you where you need to go. Um, And ultimately, spirituality and faith can do that for you. Religion as a control caller cannot. And those who tried to have a control collar on this planet and these people, (laughs) look what happened to them, okay? And look at the Fremen who are spiritual and respectful of these things. And if we need that, we will go and get that, but we will respect that animal and let that animal go, even though it's a danger to us. Otherwise, you'd have whole highways of sandworms and you don't have that. Yeah, that's true. And and, um, I think... uh... The Harkonnens and also the um, Duke Leto and 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 everyone from Caladan who come to Arrakis represent a very nice, um, a very powerful contrast to the Fremen. This is really well done in the books, but I think it's also well done in the movie um, to have these really stark contrasts between the two to give a sense of what it is like for different societies with different values to interact with an ecological space. You know, and then we also have Paul, who's kind of like the the conflicted. Um, he's in this conflicted limbo zone, essentially, between his old world and his new world. Um, and I, I want to dig into some of the characters now, and and how you all think of how they were portrayed. We'll go with Paul first, since he is, um, he's the main character. Um, we can talk about his his uh, journey throughout the film. Uh, and then we can also talk about how Timothy Chalamet represented him and portrayed him on screen. Um, Tiffany, do you want to do you want to start? What did you think of how Timothy Chalamet brought Paul to the big screen? I actually think he did pretty well. I was I was pretty, you know, and I I say that kind of um, it may sound like an underhanded uh, passive aggressive way of of complimenting him. But, um, you know, I was, I was pretty wedded to the idea of Kyle McLaughlin as, as Paul, you know, I mean, he was, he has been Paul for me. So, um, I feel like Timothy did it a pretty good job. Um, because I guess, um, I was interested in seeing his conflict actually he was very conflicted about what this meant for him if he was this, you know, chosen one. Um, and, you know, that there was that scene where they're in the tent together. And I thought it was interesting the way in which that was worded. You know, he was yelling at his mom about how you, Benny Gesserit, have made me a freak. And, you know, that's very much not <laughs> in the book, but... I can see where an audience would would relate very much to that as this this um this boy who has sort of been thrust over the threshold of manhood almost not entirely against his will but you know um very suddenly because of everything that has happened to him um his reluctance to to have to do that um keeps getting played on I think they played that well what I'm interested, of course, in seeing is like, how does that turn in the next part? You know, how are we going to how are we going to shift from a sort of reluctant leader to. To, uh, you know, Paul Muadi, basically. Yeah. Does anyone else want to jump in on on Paul? Uh, yeah, I am. Um, one of the things I really liked actually about. Besides the fact that he, he 
the the film's one jump scare is just Timothy Chalamet shouting, which is amazing. <laughs> I thought that was so good. Everyone in the theater just like jumped backwards. Um, but it was Joe you know, the the test the Gamjaba. Um, it was that scene where. Uh, obviously, I, I've only read the first film of the book, so I don't know whether or not the the one, the saviour character is kind of like some sort of split personality type deal. I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm not sure, but the way he looks at Reverend Mother when he begins to actually that form starts to actually appear, I, I, I don't. She looked like at her like she was the biggest piece of shit on his shoe. He did not give a he just didn't give a fuck, and it was, it, it was just in that look, and her reaction to that look of a mix of curiosity and a tiny bit of fear. It just that was what kind of sold me on the film being, you know, as as raved about as it as it is, because it it took me by surprise. It wasn't. It was obviously the score swelled up and the music. It was all, sh- and it doesn't actually tell you that it's real, does it? It doesn't say like that's actually the thing we're talking about happening, and, and he does that face and the like that face to to show it. It's just in the music and the and the the gl- the glare. Yeah, how he look, literally looks down his nose and bears his fangs at it, and <laughs> uh, yeah, I just I really like that. Just a little, little bit of sweat trickling down his forehead. Like I got yeah. this. I got this. You piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> anyone, anyone else on Paul? Any thoughts on on um, Timothy Chalamet? I, I like in in this version of the this film where they actually show that you know when Paul hallucinates on the spice when he dreams of the future that it's not just what's going to happen exactly. He dreams of possible futures. So there's one future where, that he keeps dreaming of um, where he fights um, Jamis, right? But, but he dreams that he becomes friends with him. And he's like, I will show you the Fremen way. And I was like, oh, that's, that's, so, um, that's so brilliant. Because later on, when he has to kill him later, that's showing him the Fremen way. And you realize, like, the spice can show you the future, but it can show you it in a weird, different way. Like you, it really hammered home for me how, how trippy, uh, his visions are and how, how surreal they are. And, uh, just, you know, the scenes where they, they show like the, the jihad spreading across the, the universe and, and his hands are full of blood. It just, it showed, I think, uh, a lot more successfully, uh, than the Lynch film that, that this is not something that is necessarily good like like it is not the Uh hero's journey um and and yeah i mean the the only one thing i will say is is and maybe this will be expanded in the second film like there's a point where he he says like you know jessica's like oh let's let's go off planet we can we can be smuggled up to the um and then flown back to to i think calan she says and and paul's like no no we need to stay here and cultivate desert power that was a choice that he made right at that moment and i think like there's a decision there that he's making to like i'm going to follow this path you know i know it's going to be bloody i know it's going to be painful but i'm going to follow this path and i i just wanted to see a little bit more of him mull over that decision i wanted that moment to be a little more powerful than it than it was and in my mind i i think it was it was probably something that was set up earlier in the film that I just didn't look carefully enough. And I I also want to say like, um, we're talking about characters like Chani, like she didn't really play a big role in this, obviously, like she has a little voiceover and then we see scenes of her, but even just the couple scenes where she's looking at Paul and talking to him, just her body language and her expressions were brilliant. Like the way she looks at him after he, he bests, uh, Jamis in the in the battle and then she looked she gives him a double take like i got the chills i'm like oh she's <laughs> she's like oh my god like this guy is different i totally underestimated him and it was just her the way she looked it was like a two second shot i was like that's brilliant i love that i love this director yeah but it was also with chani we'll, we'll, we'll shift to her now um i think it's very well done how paul underestimates her too 
And so I think that sets it up well for part two, where the both of them have this interplay where they're um, surprising each other with what they're capable of, you know? And I think obviously it's a bit of a bummer that, that Chani is quite absent from, from this part of the film, but she does, uh, she, she acts as a, as a pivotal, um, visual metaphor for Paul throughout the film as this sort of anchor point of Arrakis as, as a whole planet, how she constantly appears in his visions and how she represents, um, a lot of confusion and doubt for him, but also confidence and strength you know, where he's unsure of what his visions represent, but he knows that she's important and that he has to move forward and become something beyond what he is at that particular moment. Um, Cody, do you want to, you do want to jump in on Chani? I mean, it's a grand love story, right? <laughs> it's um, yeah. two houses very removed that come together. And yeah, I, I, I think we're, I think we're at the early stages of, of their relationship in this, in the movie, at least. Um, and, you know, it's always good to set it up with a rivalry or a, um, a, a bad meet <laughs> as opposed to a meet cute. Um, and so we'll see that kind of transform. I'm, I'm really interested to see how, what pieces of the book that haven't been adapted yet, except for maybe in the sci-fi miniseries come into, um, the second movie because they have, they have a long history together and it's not always, um, positive. So, um, I feel like I'm like trying to protect the spoiler, but maybe it's inevitable, um, when they have a kid and to see what happens, uh, the first time. And then the times after that. Mm -hmm. Tiffany, do you have any thoughts on Chani as well? Well, um, I think it's, I wonder how they're going to play this because, you know, Chani is, is really kind of a mirror of Jessica ultimately. Right. Um, if you think about the fact that um, Paul plays the same card that his father plays about a potent, uh, except, except he actually does play the card. You know, his father always reserved the card of, of having, a, having an actual marriage to someone as a power play he could use, but he never used it. But Paul actually does later. I'm spoiling, but I think everyone knows that. And he... You know, and, and I mean, the very <laughs> last line of the first book of Dune is history will call us wives. And I'm just sort of wondering how they're going to do that, because it's really sort of setting up as this uh, monogamous relationship or whatever, when in fact, Paul still has to sort of play lip service to the Imperium until he can overcome it. And, you know, the way he does that is by marrying Irulan, um, even though he claims all along that it's in, it's in name only. But, you know, it's interesting to me because they flipped around the narration, right? The narrator of the film is Chani. Well, the narrator of the book is Irulan. Irulan has always been, yep, Irulan, yeah. you know, the the um the voice of the book you know that's who's telling you the story um and it's through her lens that you're seeing him so i find it really interesting to flip that around and use chani instead i'll just want to see what they do with that does anyone have any any more thoughts on that I thought that on, on Chani, Chani was or, or really cool. Like Tiffany was just discussing the the shift to her as the as the narr narrator for the film. I'm Team Irulan. Well, I mean, Ir Irulan doesn't doesn't. Yeah, I want to see what she looks like. I mean, I, I'm just curious to see. Like, like I said earlier, like we haven't seen the emperor or anybody at all. Just their just his emissary. So uh, emissaries. So I, I I'm curious about that whole. Uh, Part of it, but I, I think it was a good choice to leave Irulan out of this, just because her story doesn't really come into the into the, the next part. Mm -hmm. and since I we're might on the topic be wrong. Of... And probably am. Go ahead, all right, I'm definitely wrong, but <laughs> I have a feeling they might not bring her in at all. Mm. At that all. would be hmm. interesting. Just, do you want to do? You, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, just because. Um. 
it's it's a conflict. There's three films set up: Part One, Part Two, and Messiah. They're, they're the films he will be adapting. A hundred percent. He is adapting Messiah as well, and unless he can find a way to cross over Part Two and Messiah to link as like a full continuation, like Lord of the Rings, I'm not entirely sure he'll be able to fit in the courtship with. Um, Shani and the courtship with the uh, again, I'm really bad with names. That's the one, yeah, yeah, very long. Cause I don't, I, I just can't see how it, it has enough time. Maybe the next one will be three hours instead of two and a half. <laughs> but there's it, just no, there's just no do time what they for did the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, they they release the extended version. That you know, a twelve mm-hmm. hour. Uh, yeah, I would watch I'll it. have my popcorn ready. You've seen for how that. much they cut out Lord of the Rings? Like they cut out Saruman's death and everything. Like, yeah, they like, cut out a lot for that. So they're not they're not above like getting rid of like gigantic parts and like restitching it back together, are they? So <laughs> yeah, that's true. Are there any other Are there any other characters or or portrayals that that anyone wants to bring up? Um, things that didn't work for you that uh, really excelled. Can we talk about Duncan Idaho? Yeah, I just I want to know what everyone thought of that. To talk about Duncan Idaho, (laughs) I love. I mean, I I personally love Duncan. I yeah, I loved. I I thought. Go ahead. Jason Momoa played him very Han Solo ish. I I I mean, like even down to the fixing of the the you know. I mean, I felt like I was in the hangar in Hoth or something. And it made me happy. I mean, it actually made me happy because it it felt warm and familiar, and I really like that. I like that about him. Um, I thought he did a good job. The one thing I wonder is how are they gonna deal with the whole, uh, you know, like <laughs> uh, resurrection Gola. stuff. You know, the Gola mm-hmm. stuff. I mean, like, I, um, yeah. you know, I didn't really see that yet, but. I had fun. Yeah, I, I feel like they, they set up the like friendship and the deep connection that he had with Paul, but then we'll see where that goes. Yeah. Does anyone else have any thoughts on Duncan? Uh, yeah, I think um, this movie is kind of short on levity. It's a, it's a very dark film. Uh, there's some jokes in there, not many. Um, and and I think there, there, like you said, Tiffany, there's a there's a warmth there with him. And I think it was a smart choice uh, to have that moment of him and Paul um, just showing showing their love for each other. And then later on, when he dies tragically and heroically, um, it's more meaningful because also Paul's like, I dreamt that you died and I wasn't there. And then you realize later he died to save Paul's life. And, and so I, I think it was more emotionally effective at that moment because it's like, you know, it was, it was a very like superhero film and like, you know, the one last stand against the enemy. And, but it, I think it, it was uh, emotionally effective because of the way they set it up. I yeah, hope that I carries that was, through. Um, also go ahead, Cody. Oh, I hope that carries through in that that's one of those rare instances where Paul's um, prescience fails him. He's not able to save Duncan, even though he's foreseen Duncan's death. And and I think that hopefully becomes a big part of the next movie is the choices that um, Paul has to make and, and the price that he has to pay for being able to see the future. Yeah, exactly. And then I think um, that sort of that same effect was also done with... Um, with Duke Leto, because he was set up as a more affectionate, warm character than than he was portrayed in the in the books. He was given a little bit more complexity, um, and he was presented as a more, uh, let's say, loving father. I guess someone who actually cared about his kin, um, and then that made his uh, his capture. And then eventual death at his own hand in a really awesome scene. I love that scene mm. where yeah. he bites down on his tooth and just like sprays toxic gas into the room of Harkonnens was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah. But anyone have any more thoughts on Duke Leto? No one could have played him better than 
Isaac Oscar or Oscar Isaac. No one could have played it better. Um, there was just such a power to how he did that. And the other thing I liked is I enjoyed the fact that when he sprayed the gas, that the Baron was affected because in the Lynch film, he was not. And it was very interesting how he ends up in the honey and vinegar or however Matt called it, <laughs> the soup <laughs> to heal. Salad dressing. I will never have salad dressing the same way again. Thank you so much. A beautiful, delicious Harkonnen salad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, are there any more characters that, that anyone wants to touch on? Um, I loved Stilgar. Um, so Javier Bardem, I mean, still like, so we, there, we were talking before about this, this clash of cultures where you have like, you know, the Atreides, which they're all royal and proper and have, have like, you know, the, the etiquette around, around the Duke. And then you have Stilgar that just walks in like right off the desert. He's still smelling of dust and, and, uh, you know, he spits on the floor. And this is like one of my favorite scenes in the book. And I was like, oh, they better do this right. Mm -hmm. And it's so good. And then they're all like, hold and like draws the sword. It's like, thank you for your gift of your water. And it's like, ah, oh, like, you know, I, even, you know, knowing that scene's coming, I still felt tension and like in that moment, like, and, and so, and just Stilgar, just his, his, um, like Javier Bardem is just a, he's, he's able to convey so much with, with just his, his looks. Like he's so intimidating just when he looks at you. And I thought that the way he just, you know, commanded the, the Fremen and, and, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Tiffany. I, I don't think Stilgar was was around in the scene where they they fight uh, Jamis, right? He didn't show up again until later. But maybe I'm wrong about that. But anyway, uh, you know, I thought it was a, a a good choice to have him there, and and just yeah, he he was great. Um, um, I I really liked every everybody. I I don't I can't think of. Anybody who I thought was just underperforming, um, you know, there were characters I would have liked to have seen more of. And I, I agree, like, before you were saying, like, Lady Jessica, she was kind of weepy. And I, I feel like part of that was due to the fact that they didn't give her a whole lot of dialogue in which to really I express herself. So instead, she used a lot of, like, facial expressions and and body language and um so i'm i'm hopeful that in the in the second film and and i think that they're already showing uh they already showed clips of it in paul's visions where she's sitting in the in the fremen cave with symbols all over her and meditating and they're like oh yeah she gets powerful like she so i i'm hoping that she is going to have a um i guess better portrayal in, in the second one um but overall, I, I I didn't really have problems with with anyone. Cool. And anyone else with the final thoughts on some characters? Uh, well, as far uh, I think my favorite performance in it was was actually Rebecca Ferguson playing Jessica, mainly because of how much she had to do in one uh, in one scene without dialogue. So, um, especially like whenever she's with Paul. You, you watch the actress and she actually reacts to his body language as if she can read it from across the room, which well, she can. Um, so I like the fact that they didn't point that out. I like the fact that she, whenever there's, there's this like distance between the mum and the son that they both have looks at each other and then look away a, a lot. And it's because they can literally sense the fear. There's a scene when they're getting into the sand suits um, that, uh, people were saying, "Oh my God, do they do they want to have sex?" No, 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 no. It's not. It's Frank Herbert, not Frank Pervert. And it's um, they end up. What what it is is he's like it just comes across so clear. She turns around and he's getting changed. She turns around to dress him, the child, and then turns back around when she notices he's doing it on his own in shock and then he turns around to see if she's going to dress him because he has second thought and that's the scene where I think the characters kind of that was the, the growth scene that that was where they actually crossed the barrier uh, and became like the, the arcs actually 
peaked for me. And it was just in that look, uh, because it it was kind of like they were passing each other on a highway uh, and going to different like character locations. I mean, it was kind of like a small representation of a son and a mother um, confusing their boundaries as one as the as the child is transitioning into adulthood. You know, because Paul, obviously in the books, he's represented as even younger than I think Timothy Chalamet looks or is, and. You know, it was really nice, you know, on top of uh, the body language, they also had their own personal sign language that they used together, which creates this really nice um, uh, communicative bond between mother and son. But you also see the interplay between the two of them as they're trying to figure out their boundaries as one is, I guess, outpacing the other in terms of how much they're maturing in, in a short period of time. So, yeah, I really agree that it was it was well done. And and Liam, um, with your background in in filmmaking and and all of that, I wanted to get into the cinematography of the movie. What you thought of that, and then we can get some some commentary from everybody else. Oh uh, yeah, excellent. Um, the the cinematography itself is obviously he's a he's a very hands on director, isn't he? So. The thing he's, he likes to to have in a, come across in in the frame in in his you know with the camera work he likes closeness and he likes size of important subject, so the subject that's the most important will always be the biggest part of on screen, and I I did watch that scene breakdown he did with the he did a scene breakdown with the uh, um the Gomjaba I can't remember the name. Gom Jabbar. Yeah. The Gom Jabbar. Yeah, you heard yeah. It, right? I've been practicing. I've been practicing. It doesn't <laughs> work. Um, it's like a foreign language. Uh, it is. Th- and uh, the I've watched that breakdown. So I watched the film again and kind of did know uh, my own breakdown for a specific scene, which uh, it was the scene where the uh, the contract is being laid out before the family and. Uh, you notice how size like matters in that, uh, for lack of a better phrase, in that uh, scene because Leto is front and center every time, but he's also the closest to the camera and the biggest. Even with shots of Jessica and Paul as the main focus, he's right there in the frame. Like on, he's out of focus, but he's there, um, and he's kind of he frames the frame. And the second he steps foot to answer the call is the first time we see him walk away from the camera and he starts to shrink. And then when he actually says how to trade, he accepts the call. It's the first time we actually cut to a wide and we see the entire Atreides like army behind them and the tiny because they've just basically signed the, the death warrant, but unless you've read the book you would always, or watched the film before, you wouldn't actually see that. And it, it speaks a lot about how much he values, you know, in-camera uh, language instead of just telling you. It, it, you could watch the film muted, and you could still kind of get a, a sense of what's going on just by how big and small the people are in the frame. Um and they also, I I really like close ups anyway. I really like like really like extreme close ups, and that was one of the things that I would like attracted me to want to watch the film was how they shot the hallucination scene, just because it was like really really up close and like the the blare of the camera ended up being the sand, just like kind of trapping them, uh like like the spice obviously did, and there's there's a lot of the f- the film's very cold and very still, uh, and there was actually a shot I did laugh at because it was it held for four seconds, which was when you actually count four seconds, it's a long time. When um when the soldiers the I again can someone tell me the name the religious Mongolian throat singy loons, sorry I, I almost called them sauerkraut. <laughs> I'm actually joking, I nearly did. Um, when they when they arrive uh, and fight the Fremen, um, that made me laugh because it was just a picture of the sandy floor 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's completely silent, but it just it was unnerving a little bit as well because it's it's either funny or horrific, which you could say about his earlier films. Like I consider Sicario an actual horror film. To me, that is an actual horror film uh, in term. It doesn't have the scary monster, but it does have all the elements that it has jump scares. It has that tension and the tensions raised so much that it breaks its genre. And I'm looking forward to what the next one's going to be like, because apparently it's going to be a lot more action, hmm. way more. So that'll be really interesting. Yeah. And does anyone else have any, any um, commentary about the cinematography, how it was shot, presented? I think it had some great aspects that you expect in a good film, but my favorite is props, you know, because what is King Arthur without a sword? What is Lord of the Rings without the ring? And I think the knife, you know, made from the wor- the worm's tooth, I think is just so cool. And I know Shawnee didn't feature hugely in the film at this part point, but she gave that knife to Paul to fight that duel. And we know the importance of the knife because of the maid in the beginning. And, oh, it's going to be an honor for when you're dead. And it's, oh, okay, let's just like write that off right now. And that's not how it turns out. There's this sacrifice of blood. And then Paul sort of makes that first little transition towards manhood. And now he's part of the tribe um, because he has to be. He has to replace the one that has died. So I love the props aspect of it. I also love the lighting. Most of the naughty bits that happened, bad things, it was dark. Mm. Mm. Like the shields as well. Mm -hmm. The shields obscure. I love them. I love the shields so much. But that was genius. We can kind of combine... They did a great job with the shields too, because to convey how someone penetrates the shield, they just have like a little thing of red in there, which I thought was done really well. Um, You know, what, what the the first time, like I said, I was so engrossed in the film. I didn't, I wasn't paying attention to all those little details. So Liam, when you're just talking about these shots and, and, and Duke and off, uh, on the side out of focus and then they focus in on him and then he takes the mantle of of arrakis and then they show the wide shot like i have to I go know, back and watch this again. yeah it's it's all about size with him uh, uh, <laughs> but again it's not easy yeah. to talk about uh, it it doesn't sound like i'm talking about a feature film it sounds like i'm talking about another type of film uh, but the um there's also something that does seem to be omitted from the books but it isn't it's it's just changed it was um it was transformed from dialogue to language, a uh, visual language, sorry, um, which is at the beginning of the the June novel when he's talking about how yes he he's on a like animals are on full alert and they have this grid to uh, to help them identify dangers when the um the flying robot hunter seeker comes through he steps into the hologram. And it actually forms the grid, and he he literally looks through the grid of the hologram at the hunter seeker as it's seeking him out, and that's how he he, he prepares himself for the attack. But it doesn't tell you; it just shows you. Cool. Yeah. So lots and lots of little details. I, I want to watch this movie with you giving commentary. <laughs> Same. Uh, if you can get uh, get the director, he'll say, "Oh, you're wrong about everything." <laughs> right. He would, yeah. He'd say okay. it in French Canadian. Um, does anyone have any any um, anything to add? We could talk a little bit about uh, costumes and set design, as well as the action scenes, kind of combining that into the what we were just talking about with cinematography. If anyone wants to go. I'll just say I think the sand suits were better being black than sand coloured because the contrast was amazing. That like they I've always pictured like the suits like being darker than the sand. I know it's supposed to blend in, but I don't know why. I just like the contrast. I like it makes it look like uh it's it makes it more iconic, I think. The 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 darker look. Yeah. Yeah, visually very nice. And I think the sand su- the still suits were very, very well done. Um, in terms of representing the the um, technical ingenuity built into the suits themselves, but also in small little details, like um, there's one bit of dialogue where 
they're putting on still suits for the first time and and the person who was it uh Dr. Leah Kynes that's that's suiting up Paul and she says, "Oh, you know, you cinched up the the ankles in a specific way. Yeah. You know, you you must have done this before and it's no. <laughs> I've never done that before." Yeah. Kind of thing. It seemed like the right you know way. Yeah. Ways as if so born just like to this. them. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I thought that was a really nice touch where it's like combining um the actual prop of the still suit itself into the storyline, into dialogue, into character development all wrapped up together. I liked how they accessorized the suits with fabric of some sort, whether it was a scarf or if it was some sort of a garment over the scarf or a a cloak or a cape kind of thing, kind of like the schmog, I think I'm saying it correctly, which is the fabric worn in the desert uh, where you can cover your head, cover your face to protect you from the sun. It was just a neat accessory. Yeah. And I think all the, all the flowy capes, Exactly. And I think all the costumes in general, Matt, you brought up earlier, the space guild, how they were represented. That scene was so beautiful just from the imagery and the variation in color of all the different representatives um, contrasted with the more gray, somber look of the, the Atreides, um, the Atreides clan and all of their, um, all of their people. And then also with um, the Harkonnens, I think their um, I think their their costume design actually went a long way in in um, accentuating the sort of aggressiveness of them, the brutality. You know, it's very. Um, it made me think back to Star Trek, where there's like the Romulans have this very evocative uh, costume design, but it's representative of of them and their culture and their personalities. And I thought the Harkonnens were really well represented in the actual clothing and suits and armor that they wore. Yeah. They made the colonizers, the whitest people on, in the universe, <laughs> just bald white people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, anyone else on, on costume design? Uh, we could also, uh, do a little, a little bit into the music and sound design, which I think really elevated this, um, I was hoping you were going to say that, Adrian, because uh, just the, the the music of this film is is astounding. Um, I I own the Blade Runner soundtrack, and that one is super haunting and and weird. And, and this one, I think, tops that by by far. It's just um, the the ability for the music to just evoke emotion and do it in a way that. Um, doesn't throw you out of the narrative is is incredibly talented. I mean, Hans Zimmer is just the perfect composer for this this film. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't he have people invent instruments for him to to make the music for this? Like he, he or he went to like he he looked up ancient instrumentation and had them craft him like variations of this. I I, I have a I, I think I read it on a blog a few months ago, so I, I have to go and revisit it. But uh, the music is definitely alien. Yeah, and sure. the sound design alone. You know, I'm thinking about the the bat, the action scenes. You know, the action is really evocative and really powerful, really brutal and up close. And I think was a good representation of how Frank Herbert uh, portrayed it in the books. But on top of that, the sound design, the the, the sounds of the weapons. You know, the sound of of something penetrating the shields. Um, all of it was really, uh, amplifying what was on screen visually, you know, the sounds of the, the spaceships, the sounds of the lasers coming down and uh, things blowing up, um, or the ornithopters as well. I really love the way that they just kind of like, you know, my wife was looking at that. She's like, what the fuck is that a dragonfly? (laughs) You know, I was like, yes, it is. And it's really amazing. (laughs) Just the whir and the, the pulsating, um, rhythm of the wings as they power up and then boom and that thing is off and it sounds so so good yeah and uh, the Benny Jesser uh, soundtrack the actual score for their group is like ripped straight out of um, uh, Atomo's uh, Akira hmm. like the, with the harsh oh, wow. fast whispers that build oh, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, like it's not it's not literally the song but you can tell that was the inspiration for a lot of the music, like um, that mm. particular film, because it has this weird, unnerving voice behind it, which obviously the voice is a 
a big part of the the narrative. And what did you think of that? Like how they actually adapted the I voice love that. from the book. That was a really good way. And I love soundtracks. That's where I live. When I leave a movie and I've been so affected by a soundtrack, I'm already downloading it in the car. (laughs) And after watching this, I was obviously downloading it because I listen to music when I write. I'm one of those weird people. Um, And it's just music that just uplifts and holds you or gets you through a fight scene or a sad scene, whatever it might be. And this is definitely one of those. And Hans Zimmer is one of my favorites. And one yeah, scene in particular. Uh, uh, but, but, go ahead, Liam. Sorry. But, uh, I was going to uh, say one. Uh, um, <laughs> I'll let you go you first. Go. I'll go afterwards. Don't worry. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I've spoken a lot. Though. I, was all, yeah. I was just going to bring up the the music and the the cinematography of the sandworm scene towards the end. <sighs> we haven't talked about that, and I think we need to as we as we kind of close out. Just the the overwhelming, just power of the sandworm as it just just blows through the sand and and rises and like you were saying liam earlier about size jesus christ the size of the (laughs) sandworm and how they portrayed it on screen and how tiny paul and jessica paul and jessica are at the very bottom and then the soundtrack just amped that up in a beautiful way it was really haunting but it was also um you know like matt what you said earlier about the just the the awesome awesomeness of nature the music really came together with what was on screen and just presented you with like this is some godlike figure this sandworm this giant giant beast um, that's what i was anyone... going to talk about what i was actually going to mention oh, uh, the i like the him uh, <laughs> um, i like the way the to like you know show the arrival of the sandworm was the, the that like paint on a subwoofer type wobble where like even yeah. when he, 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 they get knocked over on all fours, mm-hmm. like it takes over their hand as well in like a smaller way, as if like it's it's a frequency that's like consistently changing, like the sand. And um, I, I really like the way they did that because I got obviously I've, I've watched Star Wars before June, so I went oh Sarlacc, and uh, like that's uh, what it yeah. Hmm, and where did it Sarlacc come from? Like a real yeah, <laughs> <laughs> really really bigger version of it. Um, and uh, you could see all like how it was inspired, but I do have a question: Was that um the fight the way the way we see in full was that the the ultimate one, or is there a bigger one? Bigger. There's bigger for oh, sure. Oh, yeah. I'm so happy. I'm excited <laughs> because uh, it's like it's I, like I, later... I, I didn't. I really assumed that was like the god one, and I went, "It's big. It it is." I'm surprised yeah. he showed it so quickly. <laughs> So yeah, now that I know later, it's not, I'm happy. Later on in the books, they show sandworms of various sizes. So oh, you have good. like, like uh, Cody mentioned earlier, I think it was Cody or Matt mentioned earlier about like the hallucinations where it like extract like this, um, I think it's blood extracted from a baby sandworm. Um, the water of life. And then, bile yeah, from yeah, a water newborn. Life. And then, yeah, the bile, exactly. And so you have that, then you also have like larger sandworms. So there's really a lot it's of sand areas. trout. Yeah, the sand trout. The whole cycle. <laughs> yeah. Like the ecology of Dune is just fascinating. I thought they did a... Go ahead, Matt. I thought they did a good job, like, um, in terms of keeping the worms hidden for the most part throughout the film. Like, they did the, the Jaws thing where, you know, it's Jaws is scary because you don't really see the, the shark until the end. So your imagination fills in the rest. And I, I think they did a, a, a really good job of, of keeping most of the worm hidden until late in the, in the film that just builds up suspense of, of holy, holy shit, this thing is huge. And, and then when you finally see it, you're like, oh, my God, I, I thought that moment was just um but really still intense. showing the scope of the creature initially so that it's like absolutely frightening. I, I always giggle that James Cameron can only do a film after he's invented some new technology. And I think Lynch did a fantastic job with the sandworms. But in this film, wow, they are just larger literally larger than life just absolutely fr- and you see small pieces of it and when Liet Kynes you know takes that rain check that final ride out and sacrificing herself to the worm it was just 
it was just one of those amazing moments. I love that moment when she's banging on the sand to attract it. And then later we get the, um, the drum yeah. sand that Paul and Jessica <laughs> run over. Like, you know, heart in your yeah. chest kind of moment because you know that the worm's coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also the music played super well in that. Cause you hear this like heart thumping, boom, 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 kind of like you're, you're in it, you know, and mm -hmm. the intensity just builds and builds and builds. And then at the very end, they're on the rocks and boom, holy shit, there's this giant sandworm. And it's so, it's just like awe-inspiringly massive. And I love how they, how they slid like well, at the very end, you know, you, you knew if you had seen it before, you kind of knew what Leah Kynes was trying to do. And it didn't work because they cut, you know, her still suit up. So she had to just give in. But but I like the way they slid that in at the end with the person riding the worm. You know, it's really like off to the side of the line of people walking across the sand. There's this this dude riding off on the back of the sandworm. And, you know, yeah, yeah, it's like, like there's more to come. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's what those hooks are. You know, I mean, I think if you were just seeing it for the first time, you would be like, you know, wow. Okay. Like, did I just see someone riding that worm? Yeah, and it was good because it was out of focus too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was kind of blurred by 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 dust and sand. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was just like in my head, I'm like, this dude looks like. He's just cruising like a surfer. He's just like, fuck yeah, man. I'm just going for it. And I'm just riding this worm really casually. And no one's reacting to it either, which is also really cool because it, it shows how normal this is within Fremen society. So it's just another little nuance of, of world building that mm -hmm. they just, you know, Paul and Rebecca are just like, oh my God. And then Chani's just like, yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> and it goes to it show you that you're not in the deep desert yet. Right. You're not there. These worms are so gigantic and they use them to travel. You're not in the deep desert yet. You're still in Kansas, Dorothy and Toto. <laughs> you haven't gotten out there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, I think we'll, we'll close out there. If everyone wants to give uh, just some closing impressions and maybe a quick uh, hope for part two, now that it's officially confirmed. Um, we'll start with uh, Matt. Um, closing impressions. Well, um, this is, this was an incredible film. I, I've only seen it once and listening to all you brilliant people. Um, I want to watch it again and I want to watch it with a pause button handy so I can rewind and, and look at all the nuances and stuff. Cause I think, you know, maybe, maybe there is the nuance in the film there with the cinematography and the, and the body language and the the clothing and the, the choice of, of costuming and music. I mean, I think it's all there. And so it just, it, it really makes me just want to revisit this again. And I have a feeling that I'm going to see this movie in my lifetime many times. Um, I am very excited that they're going forward with the second movie. I'm also really excited for the, the Bene Gesserit TV show, because I think that that is a, uh, a group of people that um, I would, I am totally fascinated with. I think the Bene Gesserit is just an awesome uh, culture and society, and I want to I want to see them manipulating all these houses behind the scenes and trying to manipulate bloodlines and how they train the Bene Gesserit and cultivate their powers and all that stuff. I think is is going to be amazing. Um, and I think um, the Bene Gesserit TV show. You know, we've talked a little bit about this. You know, Patricia, you you thought it could have used even more weirdness. And I think um, my, many of you have said that there's not so much of the sort of like representation of space, what's going on in space with all these uh, different factions that are beyond Arrakis. I think the Bene Gesserit TV show could bring a lot of weirdness mm. and uh, alien uh, alienness to to the universe, you know, building on the popularity of the of the movies. So. Um, Cody, what about you? What are some some closing hmm. thoughts and and hopes for the future of this? I guess this franchise now. So <laughs> I hope I hope this I hope we can get even more beyond um, Doom Messiah. I hope we can get uh, God Emperor of Dune and the rest also made because um, especially with some um, editing down <laughs> and clarification of the story, I think it would be really really powerful. Um, I love the way Spice was portrayed in this movie. 
uh, you know, the, the way it just like glittered and, and kind of tinkles in the sound. Um, that makes me think in part two, we're going to get really deep into Paul's visions, which I hope so. I think because that's one of the most interesting pieces of the book for me. So, um, yeah, I'm excited about part two and looking forward to it. Cool. And Tiffany, what about you? Well, I want to watch the movie with all of you. <laughs> it's super fun. I think we need to have a movie yeah. night. Um, somehow, <laughs> I don't know how, but somehow, um, because you just bring so many great perspectives in that I, I didn't think about just kind of like what Matt was saying. Um, I'm, I'm really hopeful for the next piece. I really want to see the, the character I'm really curious to see is Alia. I can't wait to see yes. her. <laughs> wow can't wait to see her so cool and uh liam what about you um i think the i'm really happy that part two is coming out because uh, as i said by the end of the first one i i felt like i'd only seen half a movie which we did thankfully it's a bit weird to have a gun to me head to in order to go and see it um with part one and two it was a bit strange but uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Fade right around uh, there. And uh, mainly because of the two cast members who are rumoured to be playing him, which uh, one of them is Thomas Limarkey, who is a bold, really tall, really thin. Uh, I think he's Frenchman. I think he's just a Frenchman, not a French Canadian. Yeah, I think he's. Oh, he's Icelandic, never mind. Um, and uh, similar. Uh, and he is, uh, <laughs> and he's a really strange contrast to the rest of the family. So I'd like to see that. But the other one rumored is Barry Cogan, who is like really baby faced looking actor. Who is in? Uh, he's brilliant. Though. He's a uh, he's in Dunkirk and he's in the new Eternals movie. Um, and he's young looking and does look like a. He could be the contrast and younger uh, against Paul. So that's going to be really interesting to see how they actually, what they do with that. Cool. And Patricia, we'll close it with you. This is definitely going to be a film that I own and we'll see many, many times. Um, I echo what Liam said um, about, I only saw half the film because I was ready for my Fremen part. And I'm like, why didn't you pull up Peter Jackson? And why didn't <laughs> you have all of these films? So mm -hmm. that every Christmas I could be seeing something. Um, I'm anxious for the Bene Gesserit TV show because I was brought up in Catholic schools and all they are is just nuns. Yeah. <laughs> really, really mean Shaolin Kung Fu nuns um, to add to the fear. Um, and I'm, I'm into the whole shift of religion and faith, the collar versus the soul. Uh, and I also am looking forward to the potential of seeing God Emperor of Dune because that is my favorite of the books. Um, but I'm really looking forward to the cultural shift of Paul interacting and assimilating with the Fremen. Um, they survived for a reason, the planet, and they survived the Harkonnens for a reason. And I'm super excited to see that relationship and also the relationship with Johnny as well. Yeah, that last bit you just mentioned is exactly my, my hope for the second film is like, just do a good job showing how Paul and Jessica become Fremen, how they just engross themselves within that culture and how I think watching the first film and then transitioning to what happens over the course of the book, um, how much of a shift Paul and Jessica both go through personally, but also in terms of their beliefs and in terms of their perspectives of the universe and each other and family and society and all this kind of stuff. And it's like to see him come from the graveyard talking to his father to what he becomes by the end of Dune. I'm just so freaking excited <laughs> for that. Yeah. Cool. Well, that, thank you all so, so much for, for joining me. Um, we'll go in order. If everyone could just uh, tell viewers and listeners where they can find you and find out more about your work, social media, all that kind of stuff. So Matt, I'll start with you. Uh, you can find me on my website, matthewkressel.net or uh, on Twitter at Matt. Cool. And Tiffany? I'm at tiffanytrent.com or I'm Tiffany Trent on Twitter. Awesome. And Cody? Uh, website, codysisco.com or on Twitter, codysisco. Cool. And Patricia? 
I can be found at bybirthright.com. And on Twitter, I go by Tristan, Tristan with an E. And uh, yeah, that shows you where I hang out. Awesome. And Liam, what about you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Specificity A. Uh, and um, my website is specificityarchives.com. And uh, I'm also on a website called Vero, if anyone's ever heard of it, uh, at Liam Quain, all one word. All right, cool. Well, thank you all so much for joining me. I'm really glad after watching this movie to be able to have this kind of conversation, just dive in deep and, and let everything, let the spice flow, let the thoughts <laughs> flow and, and get all of this out. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you for having us. Thank you.